Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. First of all, uh, it's a great honor to receive you here in Fala Baixista. Uh, you're, you are my bass idol, my bass hero. Let's talk to bass. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Stu, first of all, First question, uh, what are the cur current projects in, in your career? Talk, let's talk to you. You know, uh, I just uh, revamped my website, stuham.com. So if you go there, I have uh, a new album called Art Spoke that is uh, greatest hits of like my last five studio records. So it gives people a chance to check out the difference between sort of the techno bit of outbound, you know, the, the more diverse music of just outside of normal, 
the solo bass part of Diary of Patrick Xavier. So it's a good introduction. Uh, and also, uh, easy links for Skype lessons and oh, recording. I do a lot cool. of demo recordings at home like that. So just released that record. And, uh, you know, with the NAMM show coming up, I've got a couple gigs there. I'm playing the uh, bass bash with uh, my band, uh, with Joel Taylor on drums and Alex Skolnick from Testament on guitar. Uh, we're also playing the world-famous Baked Potato on Tuesday, the week of NAMM, with uh, Karen Briggs sitting in with the violin. And at the NAMM show, I'm just sort of uh, playing a bunch of different concerts. Uh, the Ultimate Jam Night on Saturday, which is a collection of sort of the more metal L.A. rock guys, Rudy Sarzo and Phil X and those guys. And on Wednesday, it's the Soundcheck Live show I'm playing that has some of the younger uh, younger studio cats, Derek Frank on bass, Glenn Sobel, you know, sort of more uh, pop players. So a lot of events around the NAM show that they get to play. Oh, amazing. That's and, uh, you know, playing at the booths. Uh, and then after that, uh, I'm headed to Europe uh, to do a tour uh, with a European band of mine, great guitar player named Torsten De Winkle, mm -hmm. who's in a band called The Dissidents and plays with a great German bass player named Helmut Hotler and a young German named Felix Demmel. Yeah. And then we come right back out of that, and I play this thing called Cruise to the Edge that is like a prog rock cruise that has, uh, you know, uh, Yes playing and uh, Steve Hackett and uh, a bunch of uh, Goblin, all these prog rock bands. And that is Joel Taylor and uh, uh, Alex Skolnick and my band. And then we're going to go out and tour the States after that, and then I'm going to be recording a record with uh, Greg Howe, the guitar player, and then we're going to be touring the States in uh, July and August, and then going to Europe in September and October. So that's pretty much my 2020. Just working, playing bass. Many gigs. As many, many as I can get. <laughs> Greg Howe is a monster. He's great. He really is. You know, I've played with so many guitar players. And uh, uh, I find so many of them so boring, 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 boring guitar players. Uh, because most, know. you know, but Greg is so musical. He really just, uh, it's nothing, you know, worked out patterns. He's, he's always searching for melodies, kind of like Coltrane, you know. And uh, he's always, you know, especially when we play with like Dennis Chambers, you know, we play the same song every night, but... We're trying to make something different happen. We're trying to listen to each other and create something new. And I really, really, really admire it's Greg's It's a big challenge. Playing. It's fun. That's, uh, that's what I, uh, I enjoy and about music is how it can be different every time you play it. Yeah. The challenge is, is fun and delicious. Yeah. So good yeah. for yeah. us. Well, you know, I, I'm fortunate. I get, I get to play so many different styles of music. When I play rock, you know, when I play the Ultimate Jam Night, I'll be playing some ACDC songs or, you know, and it's just your job to play the part and sweat, you know, and, and, and jump around, and that's, that's great. That's a lot of fun. That's, <laughs> that's what the bass is supposed to do in that, in, that, in that context. When I play with Greg, he really wants the three of the band to listen to his solo and react. Uh, and then, of course, when I do my solo bass gigs, it's it's the art of interpretation, not improvisation. Dynamics. Yeah, because you play the, you know, yeah. if you're playing, you have to play the same notes. There's no question about what notes you have to play or when you play them. Right? But you could play the same note like you were melancholy. Like you were German, right? Just you know, different uh, uh, interpretation. But and to play that way, though, takes such complete control of your fingers that I find as I get older, it takes me so much longer to warm up to a point where I I uh, uh, enjoy my playing because I'm very critical of it. The hands. Very important for dynamics. Yeah, yeah. For us yeah, yeah. as players. It's where the, all the sound yeah. is in the fingers. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Stu, your last record, The Dyer of Patrick Xavier, is based on the stories of the uh, owner of Dyer, uh, Diary, who you meet in a road, room in Italy. Yeah? Is it true? Uh, how did that happen? 
Define true. Oh. Of course it's true. Of course it's true. I, you know, I read all the time. And there's sort of a, a tradition. In fact, there's clubs where when you're finished with a book, you leave it in a hotel room or you leave it in the seat pocket in the plane in front of you so someone else will find it. And especially in Europe, a lot of hotels have libraries where people leave, leave books. Oh, I don't right? know this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So I had been keeping a journal of uh, these travels I'd had, and uh, I finished a book, a Herman Melville book, actually, and I put it in the diary in the small town, uh, the library, and I noticed a book that looked like a journal, and I picked it up, and it was, it was a diary that another um, um, English, well, English speaking, I'll say that. I don't want to do that. I sort of figured out who the guy was. I did a little research. So I think he was uh, an English person, but he had sort of gone on the same sort of soul-seeking journey that I had and had kept a diary and, and by sheer coincidence left it at the same hotel that I stayed at. And as I read it, the, uh, it turns out that we'd been to many of the same places and, uh, and experienced many of the same um, emotional experiences, even though in very different ways. So then I had the idea of the record to write these songs comparing about how uh, my relationships to these certain um, stimuli or physical places in the world compared with his. And that was a good idea. And from there, the record just wrote itself. Beautiful history. Yeah. Beautiful. Well, Beautiful. you know, the, the thing is, is, is no one ever asked me what the songs are about. They say, oh, what kind of strings do you use? You know, or how do you play that fingering? How do you... Right? But when I write a song, it's not about technique. It's about an emotion or a book I read or an opinion I have. You know, it can't be a song unless it means something. But no one ever asked me about that. So for this record, I, uh, I, put, I uh, wrote a story for every song to explain what it's about, yeah. why I wrote it, where I wrote it, and uh, why, why I recorded it. Yeah. It's your first time in Brazil or not? No, no, no. no. I, mean, I think... Uh, you know, I came to Brazil many times with Joe Satriani and uh, playing with G3 and uh, working for Fender and Hard Key at the time, doing clinics at for Florence Music and Music Expo. And uh, all over, I played, I played with a Mexican pop band called Caifanes. We played in Rio, we played over. So I've been many times, many times, and I enjoy it. Many times, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, What do you experience with Brazilian music? You know, it's, uh, you know what's wonderful is, is uh, Ariana, Ariana and I did a concert last night, and after us was a band, Fernanda uh, Takai, right? Oh, and Belo Horizonte. It, yeah. Belo Horizonte. Boy, and it was just, you know, music is very, is very strange, uh, you know, culturally. And uh, for me, it's very, it's very hard to, to really play with, with like, especially drummers that aren't Americans, right? Because we have the same vocabulary, the same thing. But hearing her band play, it was so wonderful. And from where I'm coming, I, I couldn't even imagine writing or playing music that was just so, just so mellow and smooth. And it was so beautiful and so different than, than what I'm coming from. So, uh, you know. It was absolutely uh, just wonderful to hear a, yeah. someone looking at music in a completely different way. Fernanda has a sweet voice. That's yeah, great. So sweet. Now the whole the whole thing Very was just talented. was just so tranquilo, you know. It's great. Oh, amazing, amazing. Yeah. How did you come up with the idea of forming BX3, and why Billy Sheehan and Jeff Berlin? Well, you know. Uh, Number one, I'm just, they're two of my favorite bass players in the world. When I was going to college, I used to stalk Jeff Berlin. I used to literally sleep. So genius, Jeff I used Berlin. to sleep in front of his door and beg him to give me <laughs> lessons, and he would just ignore me and blow me off. And, um, and I met Billy, and uh, when I first started sort of inventing with, you know, tapping and stuff. Billy was one of the only, he was another guy that was tapping. He's carried, man. But I didn't want to copy him 
But at that point in my life, I was like, well, I'm, you know, I want to get Billy and Jeff in the band so I can steal as much from them as I can. But the, the main reason was, was that Billy and Jeff and I have completely different sounds and approaches to the bass, right? So that we sound completely different. If you had, if you had um, Les Claypool and Flea and Victor Wooten playing together. Yeah. Right. Slap and double tongue all the right. time. All the time. Yeah, it would yeah. sound like, like, like a typewriter. Yeah. Right. But there's no way, you know, Billy sound and the music Billy plays and Jeff Berlin's sound, the way he plays and the way I play, completely different. Yeah. You know, so, yeah. uh, and I'm just such a fan. We had, yeah. we had. Three different styles. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah. They were great. Uh, it was so much fun. Yeah. I, was, I, I learned yeah. so much from those guys. Amazing idea. I love it. <laughs> Tell us about your rig, which bases, pedals and, and companies with you. You know, I have a, a new uh, signature bass out with Mark Bass. I've been oh, with Mark, Mark Bass, Bass for a while. Yeah. yeah. And uh, the idea w is that um, it is their attempt to become more uh, of a rock amp. Yeah. Because when people think of Mark Bass, they think of a little 4x10 and a little uh, teeny little amplifier. And most of the people that play Mark Bass are post, little and powerful. Are, are Jocko post Jocko players? Yeah, you know, <laughs> you know. yeah. yeah. You know, yeah. Je I mean, Jeff no Berlin. Sound. Jeff yeah, Berlin. No, no, no. I mean, that's that's, that's Jeff Berlin, Hadrian Fro, all those guys. They sound like yeah, you know yeah. post Jocko players. Yeah, yeah. So the idea was to get an amp that was more tended towards the rock market, and part of that was aesthetic because if you're doing a rock gig, you can't bring a four by ten cabinet. Mark it's Bates, too small, Mark and Bates, and we're too old to bring an eight by ten, so the cabinet's about this big. Yeah. <laughs> it's very light, and uh, again, no one doing a rock gig is going to bring a Walter Wood little yeah. mini little amp. It doesn't look cool. Yeah, and it's it's really important to look cool on stage, kids. Don't don't ever forget that. So my amp has big knobs and bright lights and solid state in the tube amp. And uh, it sounds great. I worked really closely with Cicino, who is the yeah, uh, yeah. diner. And, um, you know, I've been working with Warwick. The, uh, the, a lot of the Warwicks that you buy off the line are, are, are you know, what, are like metal bases. The, uh, there's a guy that works for Warwick named Marcus Spangler, who is the main designer and builder, who is just, who is a, 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 a god of wood and a freak. You know, and so I go over and, you know, I get to pick out the wood for the body. Yeah. And he's German engineering, attention to detail. He's just a, a genius. We, I, we just talk about wood for hours. Oh, really? So this, I mean, this base is nothing like a, a Warwick that you would buy off the wall. But for me, it's just... It looks like a very ergonomic. Uh, much, much more ergonomic than, than yeah. a lot of the things. The, the, this is a prototype. It's wrong because the, the, the horn is in the wrong spot. On every base in the world, the horn goes to the 12th fret. Here yeah. it goes to the 14th fret. Oh. So it screwed me up the first time I played it. No. But uh, this is the base I'm currently most, most comfortable with. Yeah, yeah. And of course I have, you know, I have my old Fenders. I have my old Kubicki bass. I have, uh, when I was with Washburn, I designed a wonderful acoustic bass with an intonatable bridge that I play. I've got one of the Warwicks with the true intonation. You know, just intonation basis. So in the studio, I'll use anything, but for live, this is uh, the one that I'm currently yeah. playing the yeah. most. Um, f five or six years with Warwick, right? Yeah. Yeah. Amazing. I like. I love so much Warwick basses. Yeah. So uh, sounds powerful. I um, yeah. I mean, the, the uh, for me. I have one Warwick bass. For, for me, that you know, it's a Warwick bass, but it has EMG pickups. I've, EMG? Played, I've been playing EMG oh. pickups since 1980. Yeah. GHS strings, you know, good piece of wood, an amp set flat. Flat. Because, you know, gear should uh, enable your sound, not create it. Right? If you get an amp and you just set it flat, yeah. get a nice string as every action set. Uh, pedals, I, 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 for years I tried not to use pedals. Now I'm using a very few TC just to add a little color. 
to it. And again, uh, the, the thing I like about the TC is they add TC. TC they you, they have more of a um, blend, so it's it's ninety percent the sound of my bass, and I can just put a very little bit of reverb or delay into it to color the sound, not create a, a very big sound, you know. Yeah. And there are so many people. Uh, that are so wonderful with loopers, you know, and pedals like, you know, Brian Beller and, and Marcus and, you know, all those guys, you know, so I, I can't, I would have to spend the rest of my life I don't like trying to battles. be good. Well, you yeah. think sucks. Some people, <laughs> some people are wonderful at it. Bless their hearts. Oh, yeah. Besides your original work, you played with several famous artists. What would be your tips for a new bassist who wants to become a required musician for uh, that type of work? Man, you know, uh, the whole world with YouTube is, has changed. Uh, I teach in LA and I, I have a new crop of about six students at a school and they're wonderful. They're very quick, they're very learned, but they, they've just learned by imitating people's finger movements. They really don't understand the harmony of what they're playing. Um, it's wonderful that there is now this whole genre of solo bass, you know, people playing five, six string basses, sticks, and everything like that. Um, you know, when I learned to play bass, it was... Right, I mean, I have so many of these kids that come in that can play these amazing um, uh, Evan Brewer songs you know, all this incredible slapping, yeah. and I'll put, yeah. a, I'll put a chart of, like, what's going on. You know, E7, C minor with a bridge and a coda, and they, and they can't play a groove or follow a chart to save their lives. So, yeah. but, but, but there are now people who can make their whole career being solo bass players that, that have no idea what Lee Sklar or you know, uh, or Nathan East do, right? Which is playing bass in a song. There are people that can do both, but uh, the bass is a very young instrument. It's 70 years old, it's evolving. So it's great to hear. Uh, and um, there, I just, it's, it's nice to hear young bass players that are, that are still interested in playing bass. Yeah. Stu, I'm so happy <laughs> to receive <laughs> Me you too, my friend. Uh, I hope you enjoy the very much time so. in the trial it's been wonderful uh, this is first international guest here and follow bashist wow well you've uh, got another first, great one first, coming up you and ariana your social media instagram facebook all that all that uh, stuff you know the main thing is stewham.com uh where you can reach me and again you can buy the new record and you can Sign up for Skype lessons, and uh, again, I do you know plan people's demos and stuff like that. It has my email; it's very easy, StuartHamBase at gmail .com. and it has links to all my True Fire courses and uh, all the gigs and the events that I'll be doing: Facebook, Instagram, all that kind of good stuff. You know? Yeah, yeah. You know, all the stuff you man, have to do now. Man, I'm so nervous. That's all right, brother. Let's let it. I'll tell you, so my, my, my favorite story about, about Sao Paulo was, oh. was many years ago, I was uh, dating a, a woman from Sao Paulo named uh, Sylvia Mendez. Hi, Sylvia. She was a, 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 a flight attendant for United Airlines. How did I ever meet her? And um, we knew each other for a long time. Uh, I actually met her at, I guess, the first music expo. We, we were just friends for years and years and years. And I think I was here in town, either at Music Expo or playing with Satriani. And uh, Peter Gabriel was playing in town. Ooh. And we couldn't get tickets. So Sylvia found out, you know, every concert, uh, he has a local drum band come out and play Biko, you know, the young percussionists. So Sylvia found out what hotel those young uh, percussionists were staying in. And we went to the hotel and we snuck on their bus with the percussionists and snuck in backstage of the concert and watched by the side of the stage the last half of the Peter Gabriel concert. And we had a wonderful time. So thank you, Sao Paulo. Oh, funny history. Yeah, Stu. All right, man. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Um, Stuart Chan, 
no Fala Baixista. Parala do people. Thank you guys. Thank you very much. Obrigado. Thank you, Dilson. It's a long question. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>